makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. The yuan jumps after China ramps up support for the currency and eases capital curbs. European stocks slide as Apple and NVIDIA's main chip maker, TSMC, warn sales for the full year will decline more than forecast. Plus, Tesla prices cuts drive down margins, while Netflix's dims forecast will bring you many, any pre-market moves over the coming hour. Now, first thing is first, let's take a look at the European markets map. Now, a lot of these equities, of course, are driven by what's happening in technology and chip makers in general. Now, we're holding on to some gains. The DAX gained some one-tenth of a percent. The CAC 40 over in France, three-tenths of a percent higher. But really, the main focus is what's happening in chips. Now, despite the fact that AI is still in a boom, we saw TSMC, the Taiwanese chip semiconductor maker, saying they're expecting demand to fall some 10 percent. That's having a ripple effect. So ASML, one of the biggest losers in today's trading session. Three charts very quickly to really wrap up and encapsulate the main stories today. First of all is one of Yuan. This is after uh, China actually stepped up its support for the managed currency with a stronger than expected reference rate. They also changed some of the capital rules to allow more inflows. We love looking at China because if there's one thing that you have to get right in this market is actually trying to understand the Chinese economy and the impact and ripple this has to the rest of the world. Two other stories that we need to watch out for is earnings. Look, we've had many earnings calls. I know today we had, um, for example, two ones that were worse than expected. This is Netflix and, of course, Tesla. But overall, 82% of companies that have reported were better than expected. S&P 500, 12% of those companies have reported so far. And then next week is going to be a crazy week. If you actually look at uh, the number of companies reporting, $25 trillion worth of companies will come out and report. And most of those are in the U.S. So a lot of them will be in the S&P 500. So it's a very big week. Happy Thursday, everyone. I would suggest you have a nice and relaxing weekend to get you started for next Monday. Now, joining us to talk, of course, about earnings, to talk about China, to talk about inflation is Invesco Global Head of Asset Allocation, Paul Jackson. Paul, I hope you have a restful weekend because it is going to be quite busy next week. When you look at earnings, they're not doing too badly. But then you look at chips, and you think, actually, we're in the midst of an AI boom, but we have to reprice everything. What do you worry about the most? Uh, I think for me, the, the, the biggest concern is the slowdown in the global economy, which has a knock-on effect on profits in general. To be fair, profits have done a lot better than I would have imagined in the last year. But we are seeing that slowdown come through. And I think stock markets in particular are not reflecting what's happening in the global economy. So for me, the, the, the biggest worry for the second half is that there is a, a, a bit of a, 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 an awakening in the stock market and we get some uh, correction coming through. So let's look at the positives and the negatives. The positives is that actually there does seem to be around the world uh, you know, data that shows that we could be seeing peak inflation, that from now it's going to get on. So that's a positive. A negative, would you put China? Uh, no, actually, I, I, I look at China as being more of a positive, to tell you the truth. Uh, you've got a central bank that continues to ease, an economy that was effectively in recession last year and coming out of that. If you look at just something very simple like money supply growth, mm -hmm. Chinese money supply growth is continuing to rise, whereas in the US it is actually negative. Uh, so I, I would expect better economic momentum from China, where inflation is actually very low. So I think China is at a very different stage in the cycle. Yeah, and I keep on hearing, look, we're importing deflation from China. It, is, does that make it easier or harder for central banks? I, I would guess that makes it easier. Um, and, and, and I think importing deflation, I, I, that sounds a bit of a strong uh, term to me. It's, it's maybe putting too much weighting on this. But at the end of the day, uh, there are pockets of inflation in the world. Most of the world suffered inflation last year. China did not. And to the extent that it can dampen inflation elsewhere, then yes, that does help central banks. But so when you say you worry about the economy, what do you worry about the most? So is, is it, again, the, the fact that central banks have to almost crush the economies to get inflation under control or is it divi you know economic divisions i think it is that the um I, th I think the central banks have just about done enough especially in the states um but that perhaps they're going too far 
Uh, but we've already seen that investment spending has weakened four quarters in a row in the US. The consumer is losing momentum. So it's just natural that the economy is going to slow down and perhaps go into recession. It's a no. part of the process. And yes, when central banks tighten, they do want economies to slow down. All right. So Paul, hold that thought because, I mean, you came on a really busy day. <laughs> Congratulations. You Thank won you. the jackpot. We talk earnings, we talk companies. So Paul Jackson stays with us. Let's also go on to what we heard from uh, Tesla. This is the EV maker and shares falling in late trading yesterday. They're currently, well, down significantly, I think, if we have that pre-market. Uh, profitability shrank in the second quarter as prices cut, of course, hit margins. And that stock pre-market down 3.6%. So joining us for more is Bloomberg's Ollie Cork in Berlin. So Tesla earnings, Ollie, what do we need to care about? I mean, they just disappointed, really. Yeah, I mean, they beat on some estimates, but the thing that they, everyone was watching was the margin, because this is a story of market share versus margin. So they've cut you know, prices on their top models by 30% since the, la uh, the end of last year. And the margin, that is what everyone was watching for in this earning report, gross margin in at 18.2%. That was a miss. Now, that's not a terrible you know, margin for a car maker. A lot of these EV legacy car makers that are making EVs are actually losing money on each single EV they sell. However, if you go back four or five quarters, that number was closer to 30%. So it's really eating in at the margin and Elon Musk on the call said hey we will cut more if we need to so the question is is this working in the first half of this year you know the Model Y was the best-selling car in all of Europe we got the June numbers yesterday Tesla outsold Citroen and Fiat in their local market and that's across the spectrum um, and you know, so that's all positive. So in, in, that, in that way, the, it is working. However, the problem that Tesla now has is it's building up inventory. And, you know, the investors gave up their, uh, their verdict down 5%, but up 130% this year. So, you know, who cares? And the last point that we make, you know, this, this week we saw the Cybertruck roll off the assembly line. You'll remember, Francine, that video from four years ago when they unveiled this bizarre looking car testing the shatterproof glass, which, of course, shattered on stage publicly. Um, however, they're beginning to actually put these out into the market. It looks like at the end of this year, but more probably next year. So you might start to see them on the road. Yeah, I quite like them, actually. I think if you're cool, you like them. If you're a bit more traditional, maybe <laughs> you'd rather buy something else. Ollie, thanks so much. Oliver Kirk there on the latest with Tesla. Now, Paul, if you look at Tesla, and I don't know whether this is, you know, a story of Elon Musk, which, of course, he's he's kind of, you know, the, the map of the hour in good or bad, or whether this is one of EVs of one of, you know, greedy. So welcome back to The Pulse. Now, Netflix slumping pre-market this morning after projections for third quarter revenue fell short of expectations. Now, the earnings suggested a crackdown on password sharing. This is my favorite story. And the advertising tier are not yet delivering the growth that analysts had anticipated. Well, joining us now is, again, Paul Jackson. Thank you for staying, Paul. Global Head of Asset Allocation at Invesco and Bloomberg's Olivia Sullen, who's our team leader for all of our tech story. So Olivia, first, I love this, right? Because I do have, and it's a younger population that usually say, oh, I can't, I can't watch Netflix anymore because I, I can't use my family's password. So Netflix basically thought we're going to crack down and they're going to buy subscriptions. Right. So Netflix estimated about 100 million people were sharing passwords and not paying for a subscription. Yeah. So yeah, they'd rolled out this new technology to detect when people were doing that and then try and force the households that were sharing their passwords to either pay an additional fee to, to cover the cost of the other household or to force that other household to pay for their own, um, their own account. So is it not working because we watch TV less because now we're all out having drinks because it's no longer lockdown? Or is there a pricing issue or is it a timing issue? So it actually is working, which is the interesting thing. In the, in the last quarter earnings, we saw that the subscriptions were up by 6 million, which was like way more than anticipated. But I think what's not working is they haven't quite figured out how to turn that um, you know, into as much profit as was anticipated. I mean, Paul never shared a password. It's just not, it's of course. Just not your style. Of course not. Um, but Paul, I wonder whether this goes to kind of, you know, consumer, consumer behavior and how it, it, it's difficult to see how it's changed pre and post COVID because everything's a bit of a muddle right now. Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, from, from personal experience, I, I move all around and, and watch Netflix and other um, providers from different places in the world. And I think it's very difficult for them to really crack down uh, on this and different people in the same household with different uh, email addresses. I, I don't know exactly how they, they enforce this. Um, but uh, for sure, I think streaming in general is 
a lot, lot more popular than it was, but there's such a proliferation of streaming channels now. There's so much choice out there that I think young people in particular are probably having to be quite selective in terms of what they will pay for and what they will not pay for, and maybe that's the monetization problem that uh, that is being faced here so but do you think also this is a cost of living crisis i mean we are we're also seeing people going back to the cinema i mean tomorrow i'm quite excited there's the Oppenheimer barbie kind of not rival I, I'm but gonna, friendship I'm gonna, I'm gonna see mission impossible tomorrow <laughs> okay you're you're outside we can't count you as the data of seeing double films but a, a lot of younger people now go back to the cinema how does that impact consumer spending for recreational activities? Well, first of all, I was shocked how much it costs to go to the cinema now. I was shocked at how much I'm having to pay tomorrow, um, which again shows that I haven't been to the cinema for a few okay. years. Yeah. But absolutely, um, when people are struggling to yeah. make ends meet, to feed the family, yeah. you know, putting food on the table and heating the home or air conditioning now, uh, it, these are luxuries that we're talking about going to the cinema and paying for uh, TV. Uh, so I, I think it absolutely does squeeze. We saw that with Netflix where a few quarters ago, uh, sometime last year, they had a quarter that was really very difficult uh, in terms of lost subscriptions. And I think that really was down to the cost of living crisis. And so, Olivia, the other thing, I mean, where I'm fascinated by, I know you cover with the team, is, is basically these chips. So we talked a little bit about it earlier. And I don't understand. So there's the AI boom. Everybody needs to upgrade. There's these new generational chips that come out probably every, like, 12 to 18 months. But then you have, you know, the Taiwanese semiconductor saying, look, profit's going to go down 10%. Right. So I think the economic recovery that everyone is expecting after the post-pandemic slump has been a lot slower than expected, including in China. And that's been an issue for, for these companies. Then there's also the geopolitical issues related oh. to China, um, which for TSMC is uh, an issue for its manufacturing, although it has diversified its manufacturing footprint. Yeah. So it's something that, of course, we'll keep on watching. Paul was saying parts of the market could be in a bubble. We'll, we'll get to that a little bit later on as well. Uh, Bloomberg's Olivia Solon, Paul Jackson, Global Head of Asset Allocation at Vesco, stays with us because we need to talk about banks next. Coming up, Goldman Sachs' second quarter profit tumbles, we discuss what led to one of the worst quarters for the bank under the chief executive, David Sullivan. That's next. And this is Bloomberg. Now, Goldman Sachs profits plunged as the Wall Street giant notched one of its weakest quarters under the chief executive David Solomon. Now, shares initially fell before making gains as Solomon moved to strike a more hopeful tone for the months ahead. Now, for more, we're joined by Andre Janssen van Furen from our finance team. Still with us, Paul Jackson, global head of asset allocation at Invesco. So thank you for sticking around. Andre, when you look at the takeaways, I mean, Goldman Sachs and Solomon had been guiding down, so the market weren't expecting any many good results. So is it all plain sailing now that they've guided lower and actually they see green shoots? Um, morning, Francine. Um, well, that, that's a question that remains out there. Um, it's as you say, they've uh, actively um, guided the, the earnings down for the quarter. Um, in the markets, I've seen a lot of things that they expected to be there. For instance, yeah. the investment banking slump, the the um, write down on the on the goodwill for for the green sky business that 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 uh, investor inspected, uh, and um, but there's still a lot to remain. There's still um, there's still questions over what will happen next with the green sky business. Mm -hmm. Are there more are there more goodwill to be write down there? Uh, we are still in this uh, trial on, on investment banking. It depends yeah. on whether activity in that sector will pick up uh, on where Goldman goes from here. And so, Andre, I mean, overall, so we've had the big banks report. We have some of the smaller. We're expecting, of course, an overhaul in terms of regulation. I mean, is the earnings season really helping some of the U.S. banks to move on from the turmoil that we saw five, six months ago? Again, overall, does it feel like we're over the worst? Um, I think for the, for the, for the, for the, for the, for the broad sector, um, they, there is hope. We see, we see markets, uh, you know, for instance, with Goldman, the case exact after yesterday, um, shares were up, largely unchanged for the rest of uh, for, for the for the year so far. Um, there are still these, um, despite optimism, there are still these questions about um, 
you know, what will, what will the deals environment do? Mm. Uh, what, what's going to be happening on rates? So I think on the balance, slight, slight optimism, but there's still also a lot of caution. Yeah, uh, quite a lot of caution. And of course, Paul, they kind of track the economy, but not that much. <laughs> it depends. Like, I don't know whether there's any value in European banks or whether you just make a regional differential because they're valued differently. If you look at earnings per share, if you look at also some of the income ratio. Well, the first thing I would say is that usually when stock markets are recovering the way that they have been, you would expect banks to be in the forefront of that. You know, so they're usually early cyclicals. Hasn't happened uh, this time, and it's this disconnect between the market and the economy that I think is going on, and the banks are really at the centre of that. But banks, you would expect overall um, default rates to be going up at this stage in the economic cycle. Um, there's been volatility in markets, so it's natural that you get less IPO and M&A activity. That activity, though, I would think with markets improving would start to come back. But the default problem for commercial banks is going to be an issue. And the steep inversion of the yield curve is not good for banks. If, if they're arbitraging the yield curve. But uh, so what, when you look at defaults, and we haven't really seen this like worst case scenario that we had talked about when interest rates started creeping up, is it because a lot of the risk has moved to shadow banking, the unregulated part of finance? Uh, I, I mean, I think it's slow to come through, but if you think about whether you're looking at the high yield market, whether you're looking at the bank loans market, you can see that default rates that were starting from yeah. extremely low levels are now climbing up and I think you will start to see that having an impact on the banking yeah. sector. There is a lot of zombie companies still out there after the pandemic and I think a lot of that will be shaken out if we get much more slow growth and recession. Yeah. All right, thank you both for joining us. Andre Janssen, Van Furen, our finance team of course here in London, Paul Jackson, Global Head of Asset Allocation at Invesco. Now coming up we have of course Bloomberg UK and today we have a special focus on gender diversity in corporate Britain. We look at not only at uh, some of the things that came out in various reports, we also look at what the UK um, could do. Yesterday we had an interesting uh, subsidy from the UK to actually entice Jaguar to build a factory in Somerset with, uh, that's worth £500 million. Pounds. We'll have a look at that. The project of course will come as a cost. Uh, neither the UK government or Tata Group, the parent company of Jaguar, said how much public money was being put into the battery plant. So we'll talk a lot more about that shortly. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>